Hey, everybody. Welcome to this free edition of our Trade Use Group Weekly Roundup for the trading week ending May 6, 2022. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. Well, this week's theme is, is peak inflation near. We got a lot to unpack from uh, prior week activity. So without further ado, why don't we just jump into it, take a look at where we are and possibly where we could be going. Let's take a look at the index performance first. You can see everybody again <clears throat> in the red. We've had five consecutive week of weeks of losses. Um, interest rates, inflation worries, all of these things continue to weigh on sentiment, right? Um, big time. You can see here the Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, Russell all finished in the red for the week. Year to date, um, NASDAQ and Russell are in a bear market territory. Russell actually moved from all-time highs late last year, so they're below um, uh, also 20% uh, for the uh, from all-time highs. S&P is down about 13 point, almost 13 and a half percent. Dow just slightly underneath correction territory um, year to date. You can see the best sector still energy, whopping uh, double digit return for the week. Worst real estate year to date. Energy's up over 50 percent. Communication services bringing up the rear. Um, the other thing you can see here is the um, forward P/E ratios at 18.25. Uh, percent or 18.25 for the S&P dividend yield coming in about 1.49 percent 10 year treasury finished a strong week over 3 percent up to 3.12 it's 163 bips higher than the dividend yield that's going to start to attract more money into the treasury market so I think that'll probably slow down the assault in the bond market as it's been moving lower and interest rates have been moving higher uh, the earnings yield for the s and is almost just slightly under 5%. The S&P yield over Treasury is 1.86. The real yield is a negative 3.52%. So inflation has still got the better part of that equation. And VIX, even though we came down for the week almost 20%, down about 19% for the week in the VIX, it closed out the week at 27.07%. Uh, last week, it closed at 33.40. The, the magic number for the VIX, guys, is anything over 30. Once you get over 30, then the daily movement in the S&P is dramatic, uh, as we've seen um, recently. So we've got to be very careful with, with um, where the markets are want to go. Now, if we come in here and we take a look at some of the data this past week, the feds in midweek, they announced a 50 basis point rate hike, right? And then on that day, we had a huge run. It was the largest move that they've moved in the fed funds rate since um, 2000 to arrange um, um, a single 50 basis point rate hike was the largest they've done in over a, a couple of decades, right? Uh, they moved the range up to 75 bips to about 1%. Um, and they also said that they're going to start um, uh, taking away in June about $47.5 billion uh, in the balance sheet, right? They're going to start backing that off um, as, as well. But, you know, a strange thing happened. I was watching the uh, uh, Boom Boom uh, Powell's um, uh, press conference, and he was asked specifically a question about a potential rate hike of 75 basis points in the next meeting, and he said that was not on the table. And immediately the markets took off. They just went straight up. Huge, one of the strongest moves we've had since the uh, COVID era. And then the very next day, it gave it all back up and then some. And we had another huge move back to the downside again. Okay, uh, just really amazing movements. Um, the Commerce Department came out also this past week. Um, Non-farm uh, uh, labor unit costs were up 11.6% for the quarter. Um, well above elevated consensus forecast of about 9.9%. We had a drop of about 7.5% in, in the productivity, all right? Uh, that was the biggest quarterly decrease in productivity in nearly 75 years. Um, and, and a lot of this is we've had the, you know, the GDP came in at a negative 1.4% the first pass for Q1. So all in all, it wasn't that good. Um, 
um, the markets, you know, they appeared to react a little bit negative to uh, uh, Friday's um, non-farm payrolls as well. It came in at 428,000. Um, mostly above consensus expectations of just slightly under 400. Um, but we did see the 10-year Treasury breathe 3%. And that was the first time since late 2018 that Treasuries moved over 13 or over 3%. So <clears throat> we're continuing to see a lot of challenge in the bond market, the interest rate market, um, really just fairly ugly, okay? Um, if we come over and take a look at Europe, you can see over in Europe, everybody was in the red here too. The Euro stocks, FTSE, CAC 40, DAX, all solidly in the red. The only one in the green year to date is the FTSE, but just barely hanging on at five bips. But otherwise, year to date, everybody's ugly. The Euro stocks, which are 50 of the largest companies across Europe, um, down almost 15 and a little over 15 and a half percent. We're in correction territory with the CAC 40 and the DAX. Um, so there, there, there's still fear over there with the uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine um, on their eastern front. Uh, they've got very high inflation um, and there's still a fear of, you know, how's the ECB going to hike the rates given what they've got going on over there. The Bank of England, meanwhile, raised their interest rates 25 bips. Again, that's the highest level they've taken it since 2009. So they're up to 1%, the Bank of England. You know, but, but you know, we're seeing that um, the, the um, German manufacturing orders, they fell much greater than expected, 4.7% in March, all right, driven lower by a lot of foreign orders, right? They're, they're slowing down, not only from the US, but over in China as well. Um, and industrial production in Germany also dropped 3.9%. That's the largest decline since the start of the COVID panic in 2020. So Europe is having their big issues, okay? And of course, if we go over the Asian markets, Japan, the CPI is up 1.9% year over year. Um, so that's pretty good. That's regarded as a leading indicator for their country, uh, countrywide price trends. Um, and the Bank of Japan is they're trying to hit finally their 2% inflation level. And maybe after a couple of decades, they'll finally get it. Okay. Japan is the only index that was in the green for the week, but just barely at 58 basis points. Year to date, it's underwater 6.21. And then, of course, over in China, they showed those signs of relaxing their zero tolerance approach to COVID, which to me just makes no sense. But it's it's just creating economic, huge economic cost with all their lockdowns that they're doing over there. OK, their services sector shrank in April. It's the steepest, second steepest uh, uh, decline on record in China with their data coming out. So they've got major problems over in China as well. So the markets globally are not doing that well. I guess that would be our first clue, okay? Um, for our secret trader, for everybody following along in our secret trader trades, we're green year to date. We're doing well uh, with the trades that we're running and the way we run them. Um, they're looking very nice, uh, especially for our portfolio margin, folks, okay? They're running out fairly well for us. Let's go take a look at the markets and just the charts and see how things are starting to shape up. I'm going to show you a chart that a lot of people don't use this indicator very often. And, and point in fact, I don't use it too much, but it is still a very handy when you step out a little bit and take a look at things. It's called the Andrews Pitchfork. Okay, now I've shown this to you before. On this weekly chart of the SPX Cash Index, I've got the FIB. Uh, retracements and, and as usual with any fib extension or um, um, retracement it all matters where you choose the pivot points that drives everything you choose the wrong pivot points and then Fibonacci is just totally useless now if you look at this going back in time it makes it easier to pick the pivot points and what I've done is I chose the pivot low in COVID and then the all-time highs in the SPX, and that gives us the extensions that I'm looking for, or the retracements rather that I'm looking for. And you can see here, we've blown through the 4199. So let's call it 4200 um, as the first level of, of support. 
The second level is at the 38.2% uh, retracement, which is where I think we're going to eventually end up. It's around 38.16, so let's call it 3,800. Uh, and if we get down there, you can see I already marked it. Um, we'd be down about 20%. That would give us a slight bearish market, even though uh, it, it could be a cyclically a cyclical bear, but a secular bull, meaning we could still stay bullish. And then I superimposed on top of this an Andrew's pitchfork. So if you look at the pivot highs and the pivot lows, again, the pivot high prior to, uh, which was the prior all-time high going into COVID, the all-time low for COVID rather, um, and then a prior pivot low gives us this blue line, which is a general mean or a, a, a regression line, more or less, driven by the Andrews pitchfork, which shows where price action should hover, right? And sometimes we go above the blue line, sometimes we go below the blue line, but the blue line kind of is like a magnet over a longer period of time, okay? So if you look at this, you can see here that this big move up over the upper part of this Andrews pitchfork, we went way up here, we got extended. A lot of this was due to all of the treasury printing of money going from four trillion to eight trillion dollars or nine trillion dollars they added four trillion to this in this covid low and that just pumped so much money in the economy so we got extended and that's why everything in the markets over time revert back to a mean this is going to revert back to a mean folks and that mean is right around this blue line give or take four or five percent north or south of the line and then when you superimpose Fibonacci retracements on it doing that key pivot low and this key pivot high it puts us right in this area here around the 3800 level which again we can pull back to the 3800 we could even pull back to the 3500 uh, uh, level here at 50 percent fib retracement and still maintain a bullish bent in the markets on this blue line running higher so that would suggest we still have more downside to go now, understand that of the past 20 biggest single day moves in NASDAQ, as an example, of those 20 single biggest upside day moves, meaning it was in the green for the day, 20 of the largest, four of them, only four happened when the NASDAQ was not in a bear market. The other 16 times NASDAQ was in a bear market when it happened. So, that tells me that NASDAQ is now in a bear market along with the Russell, which means big upside moves can be three and four and 500 points at a clip very easily. But that still doesn't negate the fact that we're in a bear market. So this kind of gives you an idea right now of where we're sitting uh, on the SPX. Now, if I move this out of the way, I'm just going to kind of clear it off my screen here real quick. You can see here. Um, looking at a the e minis, all right. We'll switch over to the futures now. We came down and almost tapped our low for the year, which was made on May second. We're down about 15.64 percent on May second. You can see that line there. We almost came down and hit that low, um, but we're still solidly in a bear market chart. All right. For all practical purposes, the 50s below the 200 and prices below the 50. This is a bear market chart. And as you've heard me say over and over again, you trade a bear market chart completely different than you uh, than you trade a bull market chart. OK, a bear market chart. Generally, you're selling the rallies. You're not buying the dips. All right. And the S&P was the last chart for the 50 to roll over the 200 and that happened back on May the 2nd, all right? So it's still relatively fresh. Any upside movement here is probably gonna be met by sellers coming in and pushing the market lower, okay? Uh, and we're on an Elliott Wave 3 down, which suggests we've got more downside action to go. Um, and this would take us down to our point 382 fib node on the futures market, which if you'll notice is slightly different than the cash index, but around that 3,800 level, okay? Um, 
And if I say, how much further is that down from where we are right now? Well, if I just kind of put a ruler on it and just see how much further down would that be, it's not going to be that much. It's about, well, let's just do it like this, uh, about about 7.5% more to the downside. 7.5% more downside action would get us around the 3,800 level, okay? So um, I could see that, and then I do believe buyers will really start to dip their toe in the water down at that level here, okay? We still have strong consumer spending. We still have um, uh, a strong wage and labor market, even though inflation is very high. Um, uh, so I do believe that we could see some more downside action here in a revaluation of the markets, but I just don't see a capitulation bear crash uh, in this year, okay? Um, recession, uh, the camp is out. I think you've got some people saying recession, others saying it's not. I'm in the 30%, let's say a third percent camp that will have a recession this year. I'm calling for a big bear market in 23, 24 is when I'm calling for the the big 40 to 50 percent move lower from all time highs. But right now, um, we could dip down to that 3,800 level, slightly below that fairly easily. OK, um, this next week, we got CPI data coming in. That's going to be very key to where that comes in. And then we get PMI data coming out on Thursday. So Wednesday and Thursday next week is going to be key weeks that are, I promise you're going to be closely watched. A lot of people are believing it's peak inflation. If it is peak inflation and it comes off a little bit, it'll be bullish the markets. So this is the S&P. If I show you the Dow, you'll see the Dow is also um, got a bear market chart. We also made almost new lows. Uh, for the year, but we not quite. So the S&P and the uh, uh, Dow are the only two that have not made new lows. Uh, but again, a bear market looking chart. Now, if I show you NASDAQ, NASDAQ, we made new lows on Friday, all right, new 2022 lows. You can see my target here was around 12.5 and we came down and hit 12.519. Okay, so pretty much right on my target right here. Um, I think we're going to do a, one of these kind of ABC chop patterns where we may run up a little bit, but I do believe we're still in a sell the rally kind of mode at this point in time. <clears throat> so we're hitting my target for NASDAQ. We hit the lows on uh, May 6th down solid bear market, 25.33% for the NASDAQ 100 futures. And if I show you the general NASDAQ index, the composite index, it's still just as bad, guys. If we look at the composite index, it's down 26%. We hit lows on Friday as well. So we're solid in the bear market count uh, on NASDAQ all around. And again, primarily because this rise in interest rates is causing all these tech companies to have their valuations um, completely restructured and revalued, PE ratios, forward PE ratios. They're discounting future streams of cash. And with higher interest rates, you're going to pay uh, less for a given stream of revenue coming in than you would with low interest rates. So that's what's happening here in NASDAQ. And then, of course, if we look at the Russell, <coughs> it too hit new 2022 lows on Friday, it's down 26.22%. So we're in a bear market on both NASDAQ and the RUT. Although the RUT, I'm saying there's still some more downside here. This was my target in the RUT around 1730. All right, we hit 1815. So all in all, we are in a bear market on two of our major indexes, NASDAQ and the Russell. Uh, we're in a uh, contraction uh, uh, market uh, uh, in, in the S&P and very close to contraction in the Dow. Not quite, but very close, about 9.8%, uh, 9.5% 9 in the Dow year to date, right? So that's a little bit about what we're sitting here uh, on these major markets. And of course, if we look at the VIX and I show you volatility, you can see here where we're still in this um, 
uh, markets in a correction zone. Anytime the VIX is over 30, the markets get very squirrely. You can see we ran up during the day and then we had a little bit of a bump up in the close, although we finished in the red for the uh, for the day and for the week for that matter. But we're just, you know, we're still, the VIX closed at 30.19. That's still, we. I want to get it back down below the mid 20s to kind of calm the markets just a little bit. Um, but that's kind of where we're sitting here uh, right now. And then of course, if we look at the front month uh, skew, you can see here in the front month vol skew, we just barely closed into the green on the front month skew. Let's call it like flat. And if we look at the back month skew, I believe we're still in the red just a little bit, right? You can see we're just barely in the red a little bit on the back month term structure for volatility. So that means there's still a lot of fear out in the markets, folks. And if we look at the bond market, well, it's just giving it up dramatically. You can see we made new lows, 2022 lows in the bond market right here, okay? Right here, we came down to about 136 uh, in the bond market. Now, for those of, uh, of our members that have been trading, because um, I was suggesting we go short bonds um, months ago, and there are a number of different ways to express that, that trade uh, back over here. Back in November, December last year, uh, and again here in January this year, I was saying we need to go short bonds, and it's just been a great trade all around. Remember in the bond market, we we're up around 162. Bonds closed at 136, right? And it's a thousand dollars a point, so you're about 25 grand per contract, roughly. Twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars per contract in the bond market. If, um, if some of our members have been taking those trades and just doing very well and just making money hand over fist as bonds have been coming lower, and bully for them. If you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in. We're, we're, we've got some great trades running right now. So anyway, that's what's going on with the bond market. Uh, and then of course, if we look at the currencies, the dollar, it's like the only safe haven around. Right. If we go look at it, you can see that um, it made new uh, 2022 highs on Friday as well, up around 104. Now, understand the, the, the currency markets, guy. Most people do not realize that the dollar is really not the dollar. It's a dollar index and it's based on the movement of the euro, yen and pound primarily. That controls about 80 percent, a little bit over 85 percent of the total dollar index. The euro is about almost 58% of the movement of the dollar index. The yen is about 13.5% and the pound is right at about 12%. So when you add all of those up, wherever those currencies go determines where the dollar goes. Well, they're all over in Europe except for the yen and the yen you, we is just totally cratered. So that has kept strength in the dollar index very strong. Eventually, this is going to unwind and it's going to be a great trade. This was my original resistance point, and then now you can see it's strong support. We'll eventually make our way back down, but not yet. I think when the Russia, uh, Ukraine, if they come up with a negotiated settlement, you will see the dollar index fall strong, okay? And it'll be a great trade to come in here and be long the euro, because if we look at the euro right here, um, it's just crashed. Right. I mean, you can see the euro is way down here around almost about 105 to the dollar. And it's just blown right through some of my key su uh, support points. Um, and we're in a bear market in the euro, primarily because of the um, oil issue, the energy issue in Europe, inflation. And then you top on throw on top of that slowing economy, the war um as well as, as as inflation and rising interest rates. Well, there's not much to be excited about over in Europe with the euro. So that's why the dollar index is so strong. When this sorts itself out, the euro is going to do a long, slow grind higher. And that's going to be a great trade, just not right now. Okay. If we look at the yen, you do not want to catch a falling knife. The yen has just been ugly for quite some time straight down that also helps the dollar index move up higher um and the there no two central banks could be more divergent than the japanese bank of japan uh and the federal reserve here in the u.s right federal reserve's got a huge tightening policy coming out going to be reducing the balance sheet and over in bank of japan 
they're buying more, they're throwing more cash into that economy than, than you can imagine, right? So that's what's just totally crashed the yen uh, at this point in time, okay? If we come over and look at gold, well, <clears throat> gold, we have a way of trading gold. We're making money on trading gold. As I've said, I'm not, I'm neutral gold right now. Longer term, I would be bullish. Um, I think near term, it could run up a little bit, but that's not how we trade it. We don't trade it directionally. There's just some great ways to place trades in gold right now, okay, where you can make some really nice money in the options market and futures. Um, and this is what's going on with gold as we speak. It seems to be holding the 200 EMA. But look at silver. Silver is completely different. We hit um, 2022 highs back in the second week of March, and now we're down near 2022 lows coming through this Friday. A complete capitulation in silver for this year. Completely different than gold. Now, silver is either going to start running higher and catch up to gold, or gold is going to roll back over again. Okay, But silver just totally came undone. Totally came undone. And then, of course, if we look at oil, oil is another one that I like trading. Um, you can see it's over a dollar ten a barrel, hundred and ten a barrel right now, primarily because uh, the Europe has come out and said they're going to do a total ban on Russian oil by the end of this year. Um, that's going to drive the price of oil up. Um, but there's ways to trade oil to take advantage of it without being directional. Uh, and if you take the directional component out, um, oil right now is a great trade. Um, where do I think it can run? I think it probably can run back up to this 116, 117 area, and then it's going to start getting weaker again. It all depends also on OPEC and what they're going to be doing with oil. Uh, another one that we're trading that we like is Nat Gas. Okay, you can see Nat Gas um, came up. It's going to be a little bit choppy up in this area here, but Nat Gas is also uh, a good one. You can see here with the MACD, a possible uh, bearish divergence here, which would drop Nat Gas a little bit lower. Uh, but I think longer term, it's going to maintain bid, and it's going to be up over six and a half for a while. I mean, it just it got a little bit extended here, about up at nine. Um, now it's just closed at seven point nine right now. Um, I think it may come down just a little bit more and then kind of hold its own. All right, everybody, that's kind of where we're sitting at just a nutshell on some of the major asset classes uh, that we're looking at. Uh, members, I will see you tomorrow evening at our weekly market watch. For everybody else, if you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out. We're doing well. Take care, everybody. Ciao now.